What's going on, guys? Um, I want to read a passage to you guys that many people are very familiar with, but it just hit me in a different way. Check this out. This is 1 Corinthians 2, and it says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time even began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, it is written, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human has conceived, the things of God have, has prepared, uh, sorry, and what no human mind has conceived, the things of God the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given to us. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in the words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness, and cannot understand them because they are not discerned through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Okay, so context here in 1 Corinthians, and again, I'm sorry for reading all of that, but it, it seems to hit with a weight when you read it all the way through. But Paul is addressing the Corinthian church, and they are wowing over a bunch of different things, but in particular, um, what he's addressing in the prior chapter is the division that Christians, these are this is written a letter written to Christians, and there seems to be a matter where believers are exalting and boasting and thinking much of themselves based on who they follow in the church. Uh, I, Paul, I follow Paul, or I follow this guy, or that guy. And they're basically playing a bunch of um, foolish church games where they're looking at characteristics of their walk and who they follow and, and things that they practice. And they're saying, oh, well, we are more believers than you guys are. Or we're the true Christians, or we're the mightiest Christians. And they're playing games with a hierarchy of, of pride. And... Um, Paul really quickly in this letter um, establishes and drives home the fact that the wisdom of the world is foolishness and that what we received from God in the Spirit of God is not from this world. And God used the foolish of this world to make foolish the wise. He said, I desire to know nothing among you but Christ and Christ crucified. I did not come to you in eloquence or lofty speech. He considered that nothing. He kept it Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Because that's where the power lied. That's where the wisdom lied. Um, the wisdom is revealed by the Spirit of God. Um, Christ crucified 
is the foundation to which we are able to even meet and be pleasing to God and be in the family of God and be this thing called the family of God. And I wanted to think a little bit because something that just really struck me was, and, and I'm tangenting here, but this is what it made me think about was, you know, we oftentimes talk about what the priority should be in Christian art making, specifically in rapping and singing, vocal arts. And I, I think about a few things because... Um, you have this caution of, hey guys, why are you acting like the world? The world looks at each other's deeds and what they do and what they look like and who they follow and they exalt one another. And God shames that. He, he takes the total opposite, transform a man, transforms a man on the basis of what Christ has done and by the Spirit of God, they have everything in Christ. And that um, mechanism, that operating system, that new creation in Christ that is happening is all credited to Christ and in a way that no man can boast. And he seems to really want to drive home the point that these guys are not doing that. They're not moving in such a way and they're not being within the family of one another um, on the basis of what Christ has done and boasting in what Christ has done, but they're boasting in what they are doing. They are acting like the world. And it made me think from a ministry standpoint, um, like I was thinking about the wisdom of this world. Now we have a lot of Christians, including myself, who in the art space really want to drive home the benefits of what a relationship with God looks like. And, you know, the Bible says God's goodness will lead a man to repentance. So I don't think that there's anything wrong with um, the goodness of God being revealed in your lifestyle to make good decisions and to have good health and be fit or be able to communicate well or be a merciful person or a self-controlled person or a, a realtor um you know, someone who owns a home, someone who has a great career, somebody who has a great family structure and has had all that reconciled and things like that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that boast, so long as it's in Christ and what he has done. There seems to be a hierarchy that Paul wants to drive home that, guys, first off, you only have what you have because of Christ. Therefore, we only want our boast to be in Christ. And he, is, he has priority in the hierarchy of the basis to which we do all Christian and life function. Um, it always goes back to him. It always reflects on him. It's always grateful for him. It's always reminding of him. It's always seeking of him to produce that which we can't on our own, even to the believer who has received it. It's not like a light switch comes on and now you're just autonomous and you get to move how you move. And I'm thinking about, you know, in Christian art making, there seems to be this huge concern and desire to showcase um, how in Christ now we can uh, clean up on a very uh, human level and we sometimes lead first with that, like, hey, look, because of Christ, I was able to put this down and pick this up and look like this, and my life has completely changed. And I think sometimes we can be motivated to act as if that can be the main draw uh, to non-believers is, oh, let look at this Christian's life, the way that he has... Uh, money or the way he has health and the way he has oh he credits it all to God but I think sometimes we skip over that credit and we skip over that emphasis and we skip over that hierarchy that Christ deserves in our speech and in our habits to the point where it's like almost like if we mentioned it a couple of times or occasionally we just assume that people know that about us and we kind of move on to the lifestyle upgrades that we begin to um, have and there's a temptation there 
to then exalt and reprioritize that stuff. I put out a quote recently that said, don't fall in love so much with the fruits of a relationship with God, so much so that you fall out of love with God. Um, and that was really profound to me because it's like you can fall in love with all the things God has done for you and completely abandon him. And I think that we can do that in our art making as well, where we think it's kind of implied or that it'll always be zealous and fresh. And we're not getting anything from, from that. In fact, we're getting the total opposite. We're getting a, hey, Jesus did this. Now let me move on to this these lifestyle upgrades. And that's what I want to showcase because that's what I want people to see first before I explain to them Christ and Christ crucified. I think a lot of times the question is, do we ever even get to Christ crucified? You know, we build up this ladder of things to look at for the non-believer, and do we ever really get to telling them about Christ and him crucified? If so, how often do we visit that? Is that the lifeblood to which our life flows and to which we talk about all these different things that happen in our life? Are we really giving credit to him and displaying him and desiring to know nothing but him crucified and showing that to the world and also not forgetting that when we're fellowshipping with believers and just just constantly giving him the gratitude and the credit and the seeking that he deserves? I just found that really fascinating. Um, those are just meditations while I have uh, while I was going through this scripture this morning in the car. Um, let me know your thoughts on that. What triggers you when you hear me kind of talk out loud with that? Um, I ask myself a lot, you know, in reading that passage. Lord, do you have a proper priority and hierarchy in my mind as I approach the arts and proclaiming you and how I approach the strategy of being a living testimony? Do you have proper credit? Am I seeking you properly? And am I sharing you in a way that shows people very clearly that I desire to know nothing but Christ in him crucified for he is the power and wisdom of God? Is that the thermostat of my walk in the arts? Let me know your thoughts on that. I hope you guys have a great night. Be blessed.